Welcome to Cartronomics with Arjun. The show aims to unravel the layers of the fintech sector and the rapidly evolving tech startup ecosystem across the MENA region and beyond. I am your host, Arjun, and I will be inviting founders, executives, investors, regulators, and other influential stakeholders to discuss and dissect the highs and lows of their own ventures and how they foresee the wider ecosystem evolve. Join us as we celebrate success and the spirit of risk-taking the candid discussion that goes past a timid question and cautious answers. This show is produced in collaboration with Adyan, a reliable end-to-end payment solution that enables businesses to turn payments into a strategic growth driver. We're also brought to you by Lulu Financial Group, a global financial services provider headquartered in Abu Dhabi and operating in 11 countries. Finally, Couchonomics with Arjun Singh, is brought to you by M2P Fintech, Asia's leading payment infrastructure company that enables businesses of any scale to embed financial products. Welcome to this episode of Couchonomics with Arjun Singh. I'm your host, Arjun, and today I'm joined by Nandan Mayer. Nandan Mayer is the CEO of Network International, a leading payment processor, both on the acquiring and the issuing end, in the region and actually expanding quite rapidly in Africa. Prior to joining Network, Nandan was with MasterCard, Citibank, and Amex. Uh, and I'm actually uh, very happy that he accepted the invitation to be on the show. So, Nandan, thank you. Thank you, Arjun. Appreciate I hope you're comfortable on the couch, as I have to ask. It is a very comfortable couch. Thank you. So, I've got to start, start this <laughs> off with, with, a, with a fact, which you might not be aware of. I don't expect you to be aware of. But actually, network has played a very important role in, I guess, my career in the Middle East because I arrived in the Middle East 12 years ago on an engagement in a previous consulting avatar to work on the first divestment which ENBD did with network. Uh, And I spent about six months of my life uh, uh, on that engagement. During that six months, uh, we decided to have a baby. And 12 years later... (laughs) I'm still sitting here. So I, I guess it's a good or a bad thing, but I think Network has a has a role to play in my career in the Middle East. Well, I'm, it's a great thing because, uh, you know, the Middle East is now benefiting from an enhanced, uh, you know, what should I say, uh, talent pool that it won't otherwise have access to <laughs> well, <laughs> if you hadn't decided to work on the deal. Well, that, 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 well thanks a lot. I'll take that as a benefit. So... I know, you know, these are short call, uh, these are short podcasts, we, you know, we try to get to the point straight away. So I'm, I'm going to dive straight in if sure. it's fine with you, right? So, you know, digital commerce uh, was accelerating even prior to COVID uh, for a number of reasons, technology, consumer behavior, uh, you know, enabling regulation. And then the way I like to call it is COVID was the accelerant. Yes. Right, it came and Absolutely. sort of accelerated. Uh, and obviously the initial acceleration was on e-commerce, which is sort of kind of tapered down, I think it's come down to a healthy growth rate. But we also saw a massive shift of what happens in in-store commerce, right? People shifted away from using cash, people shifted away from using swipe cards and chip and pin to, uh, to, to um, um, tap and go. Tap and go. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> what it also did was bring in a whole range of competitors, right? Uh, either existing competitors who woke up to the opportunity and so obviously stepped up the mark, right? Uh, and some new players which entered. So there's hyper competition, right? Yeah. And 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 as you guys were the leaders, right? How how do you see all of this sort of play out? And 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 kind of what sets NI apart, specifically if you take UAE as a region, a UAE as a country, to sort of continue winning. Sure. So uh, your, observa- your observation is, is spot on, Arjun. Um, and there's still, the, while the transition has accelerated over the past few years for the reasons that you rightly articulated, and of course COVID being the accelerator, there's still a long way to go. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, cash is still the dominant exchange of value for goods and services. Uh, you know, it depends on which region you're looking at. In our region, on the average, cash is still used for 80% of all consumer payments. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the UAE, less so. In many of the other markets that we operate in, which I'm sure we'll get to over this conversation, um, you know, cash is even more dominant. In some markets, as high as 95%. Mm -hmm. So lots of uh, opportunity for growth, secular 
uh, winds are behind us because of change in consumer behavior. So I'd say that there's plenty of room for folks like us and our competitors, which we welcome. Competition is welcome because it helps actually grow the pie Agreed. for electronic payments, right? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about it in any industry, uh, any single company cannot take on the burden of, you know, being, being the, the ecosystem maker. or yeah. being the marketplace for any any single good services, etc. So we're actually uh, very pleased that there's increasing competition because we see or increasing number of players that are helping uh, in the transition from electronic payments, from cash to electronic payments. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, you know, network's been added for a while, for the better part of 20 plus years. Yep. First started with ENBD, the journey that you actually helped uh, help begin. Uh, and, you know, over a period of time, it's had, you know, a change of uh, ownership and now as a publicly listed company. Uh, the journey has only accelerated with time. So, uh, you know, we are fortunate that we operate in great markets like the UAE. Uh, we are fortunate that we're a well-invested company. So the way I look at it, I'm new to network. I'm the new kid on the block. Uh, I have the good fortune of uh, leveraging some great tech that exists in the company. Um, I'm the good fortune of working with great people who are industry domain experts who've mm-hmm. been who've been in the industry for a while. And so I'd say that <clears throat> while we welcome competition, we're also ready for competition. You know, we're ready to compete. We've we've had dominant market share in the UAE and many of the other markets that we operate in. In fact, if you if you really, you'd be very hard pressed to think of any name other than network in Middle Eastern Africa that spans 50 markets, that is has 150,000 merchant customers, mm-hmm. that has 200 banks in its in its customer roster, and does the full range of services, whether it's uh, you know <clears throat> serving small micro merchants, uh, you know, literally startups that were created a day or two ago or even last were born last week to the more established enterprises that have been around for decades and our multi-market companies with very sophisticated needs where we integrate very deeply into, into their ecosystem. So um, I'd say, look, in any industry, competition always keeps, uh, you know, the market leader honest Uh, And the way I look at competition is they do a great job of keeping us honest, keeping us on our toes, which means that we are innovating at a faster pace with increased competition than we have in our history. No, no, that's a very healthy, healthy, I I guess, healthy philosophy to have, which sort of brings me to a question. And and I guess most of my audience uh, would want to ask this question, right? So a few years ago, um, um, and I, uh, in my world, decided to go down a strategy of cooperation, mm-hmm. right? Uh, where you actually helped enable the entry of, you know, three global giants in, sure. the, in the space of payments, um, Adyan, uh, to name one, yeah. uh, Stripe and Checkout. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what was the sort of the strategic thinking behind that, sure. right? Sure. Um, so first and foremost, I'm going to give the credit uh, for the thinking to my predecessor and the team that I have inherited. Uh, these um, partnership deals predate my arrival. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it was absolutely the right decision to make for the company for a couple of reasons. One, uh, payments is both a very wide and a deep space. So mm-hmm. We talked about the fact that payments has a lot of runway, f- electronic payments mm-hmm. has a lot of runway for growth. And the burden, or I shouldn't even call it the burden, the onus uh, of serving the market cannot be you know, on the shoulders of one single company. Mm-hmm. In fact, in payments around the world, you will see that there are there's a lot more cooperation than in many other industries. Mm-hmm. And the reason that com- payment companies need to come together is because it's a very capital-intensive industry. Mm-hmm. A lot of money goes into building the tech and building the connections with the payment infrastructure at the back end that is not visible to either the merchant or the consumer at Agreed. the front end, right? These transactions flow in nanoseconds. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of magic that needs to happen at the back end at very high speed for transactions to connect from a point in the UAE to, let's say, an issuer in Australia as an example or vice versa. And then there are multinational companies that also have unique needs versus domestic companies. Mm -hmm. So those multinational companies do need to be served the world over in a specific way versus a domestic company that 
may have a more finite ecosystem that a local company like ours can serve because we are not in europe because we are not in the united states because we are not in asia we need to partner with companies that have a more global footprint that are that need to raise the bar on the services that are available for the local subsidiaries operating in the middle east and africa so we provide that connective tissue to the likes of adian to the likes of stripe and checkout to provide that local if you may relevant solutions to their global customers and so by joining forces ultimately we're helping to expand the market and serve our customers better no, and so why not right i agree why not but th- let me let me sort of uh, sort of uh, i'm not challenging the question yeah, let please. me just ask a question so is this something you're going to do more often right uh, and the second part of this question is i'm assuming you will do this more often with an open mind that a number of these or i can say a number of these but some of these will possibly you know cut the umbilical cord and go independent themselves yeah. and and i'm assuming these are factored into your your sort of thinking going forward absolutely and they would have cut the umbilical cord whether it was network or any other partner that they're partnering with and again i think the ultimately if you take the view that all of us in the in the payments industry that are facilitating electronic payments we have one fundamental uh, responsibility as companies which is to help economies grow mm-hmm. and to help businesses grow in those economies in fact i'd say it's the inverse you help the businesses grow and when you help businesses grow Economy economies grow and when economies grow businesses thrive so if you take that approach then essentially when you make decisions you make decisions on the basis that what's the best thing to do to help a customer's business grow and if the best best solution to provide to the customer is to partner with ecosystem players and we, you've named out you called out a few but we have hundreds of other partnerships that we have that are similar sure. in nature yeah. that provide services that are similar to our ours but yet we partner together the ultimate objective is to help our customers business grow right and and i i've got a very simple view to this too you know when 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 i first heard of this news my reaction was very simple uh these players are bound to enter the market Correct. right uh if they're not going to find ni as a partner someone else they'll find somebody Correct. else Correct. right and it's better to have a smaller percentage of a pi than have no percentage of a pi thank you uh, that's the economic rationale yeah, well, you I, nailed I, it yeah so so <laughs> you know uh, and and i and yes you, one can say that you know you you've left you've let competition through the door but it's not a door that you can ajar right it's it's right. a door it's a door which can be opened right, right. You, you can't keep holding it's not in our control right Exa- exactly yes. so it's not in control so that's kind of how i rationalize mm-hmm. it's good to hear it from you and and and, and it's very grateful of you to give the i guess the, the credit to your predecessor because you're correct it actually happened before your arrival uh in time um you talked about alternative payments right um the vast majority of the electronic payments still sort of rides on the rails of visas and mastercards but we are starting to see some early days of alternative payments right very very early days and actually funnily enough some of those alternative payments are still using the visa and mastercards in the way they collect payments bnp being one example right let me ask you an honest question as as a commentator of a market maybe not as a ceo of network international if you if you can sort of wear those two hats do you really see alternative payments take hold again in a market like the UAE before we sort of start looking at other markets and Africa is one which I'm very interested to hear your view on um uh rapidly and and if so then which alternative payment do you really see you know india is all about upi and sort of faster payments there are other markets where uh, you know they have their own local schemes china being one russia being one how do you see it play out in this little sort of small market called uae yeah sure actually uae happens to be one of the more as as you mentioned in your opening i've had the pleasure of serving multiple companies i've also worked in about 10 geographies prior to coming to the uae lived and worked in those geographies and i'd say that uae uh, to the point i think you're making is a highly competitive and sophisticated market mm-hmm. in more ways than one <clears throat> and we can talk about that endlessly uh but the answer to your question is i think is a triple yes i'd say alternative payments have a significant role to play in again the growth of businesses and the growth of economies and that's where companies like ours come in ultimately our job is to make sure that any retailer or anybody who is in the business of selling goods and services is able to exchange it 
for a store of value mm-hmm. that store of value could be an aed it could be a dollar it could be a canadian dollar a pound it could be air miles it could be telephone uh, talk time it could be anything that has a store of value that is electronic Crypt- cryptocurrency <laughs> cryptocurrencies absolutely right and so that's the business we are in we are in the business of helping our merchants take payments in exchange for goods and services and so if you take that view you will i mean companies like ours and we offer i'm going to say roughly about 25 different stores of value that our merchants can accept so for example digital wallets like uh, alipay and wechat pay mm-hmm. uh, local brands like rupe um, like misa from egypt yep. mada from some saudi uh, uae also happens to be uh, in many ways the center of the world this is where people from 200 countries live mm-hmm. this is where people from all over the world come to holiday etc it's a great experience and so our job is to make sure that wherever you may come from in the world you're always able to live the life on your terms without having being, being constrained by a payment type mm-hmm. and that's where what we call alternative payment types lovingly as a collective yep. for multiple brands for multiple form factors whether it's you know a digital wallet or a direct connect to a bank or cryptocurrencies as you said ultimately it's about making sure that the merchant has a smile on their face because that cupcake that they were trying to sell or the bag of chips that they were trying to sell has flown off the shelf yep right and that's where so the role of alternative payments comes in and companies like ours are working very very hard to enhance the number of electronic payment stores of value that can be accepted at any point of sale or online so so obviously key part of that is the the infrastructure play right yes. so you, so obviously you're you 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 are at heart a processing uh, organization which is uh, you know infrastructure is a key part of it so let let me ask you a question maybe it's not a part of your strategy maybe it is maybe you don't want to answer this question right so so we we are all kind of waiting open banking open finance to come into this market right and and that will unlock uh, or unleash whichever word you prefer a a, a need need for infrastructure provisioning right and we also know that uh, as a part of open banking one of the, the the most common use cases is payment initiation or payments related activity whether it's b2b b2c right do you see yourselves migrate into that space do you see yourselves becoming open banking enablers in terms of infrastructure players um it's not something that i saw in your annual report maybe i didn't read it deeply enough but is that something where if i was to put you know uh, ask you to look into your crystal ball 5 years from today it is an area where a, a network would operate uh, so this is a very well kept secret and <laughs> uh, at network we should talk about it more and the fact that it doesn't show up in our investor decks or annual report shame on us uh, but we're already there okay. uh, arjun so uh, let me explain how uh, <clears throat> i also i mentioned that network is also in the business of provisioning 20 million uh credentials through 200 banks yes. in 50 markets in Africa and Middle East some of our customers are traditional financial institutions mm-hmm. not all are so some of them are new fintech some of them are mnos some of them are retailers who are issuing prepaid products or digital wallets etc cetera, etc cetera. so in a sense because banking is a regulated regulated activity and many of these companies that are providing these services are leaning off the capability or the let's call it the license of the bank mm-hmm. but require modern infrastructure that modern issuance and what we call provisioning credential provisioning infrastructure is provided by network mm-hmm. and like i said we are in the business of uh, i mean currently we have a 20, 20 million credentials under management if i was to hazard a guess i'd say roughly 20% of those credentials are issued by non non banks mm-hmm. by in fact challengers to banks is one way to think about it the other way to think about it is fintechs the third way to think about it is open banking partners because in effect what is what is a fintech a fintech is leveraging some of the assets of open banking it not may not be everything that open banking represents but it's a subset of what open banking represents totally yeah totally so 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 let me let me put some words in your mouth uh, are you guys going to inorganically expand buy out some of the infrastructure players like the network like the mastercards and visas have to enhance the infrastructure player uh, or, or are you going to build this in house or is it purely a partnership strategy 
or as someone will say, it's all of the above. <laughs> I, th- I think that would have been my response. All of the above. We would look at acquisitions. We have been an acquisitive company. Yes, you, you know, have. EMP yep. uh, a few years ago, you know, which is, you can't tell the difference. Everything's NI now. Yeah. DPO, which I'm sure yep. we'll Ooh. have some questions yeah, on. I do. That's the next <laughs> one on the line. Coming up soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, is another company that we've more recently acquired. There'll be others. And I think, Arjun, the point is that we are all, we're, we look at buy, partner, uh, and build as three equally weighted pillars. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we're interested in is the fastest return on invested capital yep, for our shareholders, right? And doing what is the most efficient and the best way to serve our customers, right? If we can build it, and we believe building it is a better way to serve customers than acquiring a certain set of capabilities, then that's what we'll do. So I, I'm not sure I can uh, answer that uh, that question at this point in time, but we look at all options. No, and that's fine. And I, my point was to actually just understand that is that in the mindset? And I, obviously the answer is yes. And, 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 yes. That, and, and that gets it. So we come to DPO, yes. right? So so it was very good to hear. I obviously uh, read your latest investor report that, you know, DPO is performing above expectations, right? So two questions, Yes. right? What next for DPO sure. um, in terms of b- taking it beyond the countries that it's in, in terms of the the core proposition. And then what next for network in Africa? Sure. So let me answer the first part of your question. Uh, I'd say DPO started its journey in the e-commerce space as an online payments company. Still is an online payment company, but essentially has the potential to be a unified commerce company. Sure. Right? When you start from online, it's much easier to gravitate into the offline space. And as you know, network has a long history of being, of serving customers in the offline space for a while. So when you put the assets of DPO and network together, you're looking at a unified commerce proposition uh, that we'll be launching soon in many of the DPO markets, but starting with uh, the South African market, which is the largest footprint of DPO currently. So that I think is something that you can expect to see in in the near future. I'd say some geographic expansion. DPO is already in 20 markets yep. in Africa. Uh, there's many more than 20 markets. We know, let's call it f- roughly give or take 50 markets in Africa. So there'll be some geographic expansion. But I have to say that in the markets that we're in already, in the 20 markets that we're in, there's plenty of room to grow I would in terms so. of market share. Now, in the online payments, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess because information isn't perfect, but we believe we have more than 50% share uh, in South Africa, uh, but we're clearly nowhere in terms of share in the other 19 markets that we're in Africa. We certainly, if you know how to compete and get to that level of share in the UAE and that level of share in South Africa, the question you have to ask yourself as a company is, why not have the same level of share in some of the other markets that you're operating in? Mm-hmm. So we are going to be going after share in some of the existing markets, but we will open new markets uh, in, in due course. So give us a little bit of tip. So w- what, how is business different in Africa? So how do you do things differently? Is it different? Every market is different, right, Arjun? But I mean, even Saudi Arabia yeah. and UAE, neighboring markets, yeah. uh, and maybe some, maybe you'll come to Saudi. So and, what's, uh, what's, at, what's at, the secret sauce for Africa then? I'd say it's, it's recognizing uh, what's common, but we also what's unique. So I'll give you some unique right. as, uh, characteristics. Typically, whether it's the local uh, interbank clearing system okay. or the uh, if they have a domestic brand, then you have to recognize that the domestic clearing system and the domestic brand are going to survive and in fact thrive in the long term. Yes. So integration into the domestic clearing system, interbank system, and into the local uh, you know, domestic payments brand is extremely important. And without doing that, I don't think anybody should expect to succeed in any market. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we are very, very focused on as we enter a new market. Then I'd say integration with the mobile money operators. Mobile money in Africa is a a force to reckon with, as you know, right? Not quite so in the Middle East. So you're asking what's the difference. Uh, If we enter any new market in in Africa, the first thing we want to do is integrate with the mobile money operators. So I would say that actually in Africa, you had raised the question about alternative payment rails. In Africa, I'd say APMs are the core business. Totally. Right? In a manner of speaking. Totally, yeah. And you have to recognize that and you have to build your business around the APMs APMs. and the core being APM and then do 
many of the other international brands etc that you're also doing for example alipay we pay you talked about rupay and a few others but whichever ones they are these people are still traveling into africa from all over the world too tanzania kenya south africa to name a few markets botswana that sees a lot of international investors so we are very focused on enabling the domestic payments infrastructure and enabling the cross border payments you know in addition so i think some of the challenges that payment companies face is when they kind of focus on the cross border piece and mm-hmm. they kind of don't focus enough on the domestic, domestic piece we are very much from the middle east and africa for the middle east and africa and so for us the domestic payment infrastructure almost becomes the first uh, you know port of call mm-hmm. for us to enable even before we go after the international flows and 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 again so it's it's a question obviously i'm not going to work the numbers out here because that kind of the back of the fact packet but you know if i look at if i look at 5 to 10 years ago i can see your african business actually be bigger than what you might actually have in the middle east i i would not argue with with you on that score which basically means yes. that there is actually yes. going to be a massive shift in the way the management of the organization looks possibly you know is there an intention to create a parallel headquarters in in somewhere in Af- in africa to to sort of lead that charge so let me give you an interesting uh, piece of information uh, our ue we have 1700 employees yes. in the group less than 50% of our employees are based in the middle east, middle east no. more than 50% of our employees are based in africa africa and our hubs that they are based in are egypt nigeria ghana south africa and kenya we also have we have uh employees based in about 20 other markets but we have a hub and spoke these are the hubs uh you know sort of um capability set and uh, these are the hubs in each one of these markets we have uh roughly 200 plus people all right in the hubs excellent on the ground which keeps us locally relevant right yeah, and, and, and you're that, asking how do you how do you and that you know, was the point that was africa exactly. you have to be locally yeah, relevant yeah you cannot do right? the seagull Yeah. You cannot do the seagull flying and fly out. I've seen a lot of companies try. Um, a lot of companies regressed, I think, during COVID. I still disagree with that strategy, right? Irrespective of what line of business you're in, especially in your line of business, especially trying to solve the domestic problems and understanding the dis- domestic ecosystem. So let's talk about the kingdom, right? Uh, uh, we had a brief conversation earlier today uh, that you're making some very good progress uh, uh, with, with setting up shop, if I may use that term, in, in the kingdom. Um, I guess my question here is is you know what's going to be different about how you're going to do business in the kingdom compared to the UAE it doesn't have to be but if it is and 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 sort of what makes you feel comfortable that you know you have a right to play and win there sure. in a market where there are a number of players yeah right yeah. sorry for being very no, no, no. straightforward it's, with this question it's the right question to ask there's never a bad question there are only bad answers so let me try and give you a decent response uh we are very excited about uh the prospect of growing our business and serving the market in the kingdom uh we we fully committed to doing that we've made a, a, a reasonably chunky capital investment mm-hmm. in setting up our technology in the cloud mm-hmm. in jeda with a backup in riyadh yeah. so all our uh processing our data management will be done on soil in saudi arabia uh we built an office locally uh it's led by a captain of industry who's a saudi uh, in uh, professional who's worked at the central bank and worked in uh, commercial banking with one of the top 5 saudi banks and has a stellar reputation for being you know a great leader and and a great um, practitioner of payments uh, in saudi arabia and he's building a very talented team a fully saudi national team so you know a, we're we're excited about the fact that our team will be you know locals highly talented locals um and uh, you know we're bringing our full suite of capability from um from the UAE to the Saudi Arabia with significant enhancements mm-hmm. right um uh, because we had the opportunity to start from scratch so you know you don't you don't take some of the legacy stuff that totally you got yeah. over a period of time you're you're able to modernize it and when you take it into a new market so it's a highly modernized capability set <clears throat> and what we're hoping to do is you know uh help the banks grow their business help merchants grow their business and our pitch to the banks is look there's many ways for you to grow your business and to compete for example branch infrastructure brand uh product quality 
uh, service quality, pricing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let us be your operations and technology co-investment partners mm-hmm. uh, to help serve the marketplace better, to help serve your consumers better. Essentially, what we're offering the Saudi market is payments as a service, mm-hmm. right? And you pay for only every transaction that we process, and you don't have to make the capital investments, the hundreds of millions of dollars that go into building the infrastructure that sits behind a payment service. We will take the load of that, and you come on over, make the best use of that infrastructure, and provide your consumers and provide your merchants with you know uh, with excellent customer service and a consumer experience. And that's the role we intend to play. We're approaching it with humility. We're new to the market. We learn a lot of lessons as we establish our business in the market. We're here to learn. We're not here to just contribute. We'd love, we'd love to believe that we can make a contribution. But equally, I think we as a company serving the Middle East and Africa will learn some valuable lessons from the Saudi market because of the nature of the market. And we hope to take those learnings to the other markets in which we're serving customers. Today. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I think three things I take away is that one, it's, you know, you don't have to build anything from legacy. Very important. I like the fact that, you know, you you make the point about being sort of humble and sort of two ears and one mouth. So you're going to listen more than you're going to talk, which I think is quite essential. And I think, as you said correctly, it's not just what you're going to take away from the Saudi market to the other markets, but actually you have some good practices from other markets that you can take into Saudi. My last question, I'm conscious that I, I've, 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 I've horribly overrun, uh, but this, this, the, the, this one just, just popped in my head. So, so a number of your competitors, right, in, in different markets, whether it's UAE or otherwise, uh, who are either spun out of banks or are still resident within the bank in some form or the other. Um, uh, it, 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 especially if I look at the acceptance play, uh, not the issuance play, we all know that you know margins and acceptance are, are are thin and arguably under more pressure. God only knows where interchange heads next, right? They're going to be leveraging their banking relationships, and especially with the, I guess, if I may say, the SME merchant segment, where they'll try and bring banking products to bear, right? Um, are you guys planning to do any of that, or do you want to be a pure play, sort of? fintech which focuses on processing uh, acceptance and issuance uh, payments. Yeah, so the good news is that network has learned to be in business, survive and compete uh, with the, for the last, I'm going to say, pretty much close to a decade without being part of a bank. So, yes. you know, uh, we've developed some s- survival and competitive skills <laughs> over, you the have, last, exactly. over the last 10 years, yeah. right? Uh, give or take. Uh, having said that, I think ultimately uh, the point you make is the right one, which is uh, transaction processing is being commoditized at a very rapid pace. And the revenue and the ability, therefore, for companies to continue to invest in technology and enhancing its services and helping businesses grow is not going to come necessarily from the transaction, uh, but going to come from the value-added services that are provided to a merchant and to a consumer. And Arjun, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, you know, we do offer a range of value-added services, whether it's data services, uh, information services that help uh, merchants benchmark their business to their own business in the prior year, prior month, prior week, or to a competitor set uh, without naming the competitors and making sure that there's anonymity. We also help them benchmark themselves against their competitors. So that helps them think about their businesses mm-hmm. in more ways than one. Uh, we also offer uh, lending for our merchants based on transaction flows. Mm-hmm. We've partnered with multiple banks. And so merchants can have access to working capital finance. And then the repayments on that working capital finance are deducted from the flows okay. uh, that we owe the merchant. And last but not the least, we also help our merchants sell product through buy now, pay later partnerships sure. that we have with buy now, pay later companies. So l- I, th- the point I'm making is, there is nothing an independent payments company cannot do. Agreed. It's that an can anchor. be done by a bank. You just have to have a flexible mindset. Yeah, exactly. And you have to always tell yourself that there is a purpose for which you exist. And that purpose then guides your direction, yeah. which is we're here to help businesses grow and to help economies thrive. And if, if that's our North Star and we keep focused on that, we will do whatever it takes to serve our customers well which in effect means that we will be competitive, if that yeah. makes sense. I think an open mind and the fact that there is enough to learn from and 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 actually, fortunately, for in your case, having the capital to deploy, I think you know, it's a great combination to have in three. 
Nandan, I want to thank you. I apologize. <laughs> I've, I've overrun. No, no. Uh, it's a topic which is very close to heart. Uh, uh, I look forward to our next conversation. I will be very, very keen. and uh, I will observe your growth in, in Saudi very closely because I think it will be an interesting case study that you're setting uh, because there aren't many, uh, with all due respect, I think UAE-based or headquartered businesses who have gone and necessarily you know, uh, uh, stolen the show in Saudi, but um, um, there's no doubt that you guys will achieve it. So with that, thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Arjun. I really appreciate Forgive, you taking For giving time. me the opportunity to speak to your viewers. Right? I really appreciate it. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. I, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Nandan Mayer, who's the CEO of Network International. I think we talked about UAE. We talked about Saudi Arabia. We talked about Africa, e-commerce. I think there's a lot which was covered. I think there's definitely a part two to this, uh, which we'll try and cover in the second season. But for now, uh, I'd like to say thank you and goodbye. Um, and see you next time.